diagnostic approach to global development of LA is uh, a, a practice where there's a lot of variation across the globe. And if you look at uh, resources from US, Canada, UK, Iran coming from Africa, and uh, other areas of Australia, Ireland, you'll find a lot of variation there. So we just try to look at the different sources of that literature uh, and uh, the other guidance proposed by our team uh, come from all the regional hospitals in Europe and UK. So let's start with the basics first. Okay. So global development and delay, as you all know, is a delay to a whole event. And uh, it is significant when it is uh, especially checked on standardized tools. And it is to the Global development and delay is uh, used uh, until five years of age. After that, it is the term intellectual disability. Now, I, I want to just illustrate uh, here the fact that uh, if you look at these trajectories, and uh, if this is the normal, the upper one is the normal one, and if the second one indicates global development and delay, now, it's very important to see that if you look at this regression trajectory here, that initially it overlaps the global government to the delay here, and then there is some stagnation in the last year. So it's here that we are investigating that we, are, we can still do global development investigations. Uh, but when the regression is there, then it becomes quite uh, obvious here. Yeah. Now, right. uh, now, global development of delay can be divided into uh, different subtexts. Disability is basically different from global development today in a way that here you need deficits in two domains, both intellectual uh, functioning as well as adaptive functioning. And at adaptive functioning, at least in one of the domains, which is the conceptual, social, and practical domains. And it applies to children who are five years and older, when you can actually measure the intellectual function. Now, epidemiology, uh, if you look at uh, uh, statistics, it's about one to three percent of the uh, Operation will have global development of DA and 1% uh, class will be have disability. Uh, prevalence in terms of gender and age, and mild to moderate uh, lack of disability, there is a uh, preponderance of uh, uh, the male gender, but as uh, you move the severe uh, uh, domain, so this different other domain here. Now, overall, etiology can be found in about 40 to 80% of the cases, and uh, particularly so. Uh, when you're dealing with this, we have the uh, intellectual disability. Now, uh, if you look at the causes, broadly you can divide them into intrinsic and extrinsic, and uh, uh, extrinsic can be prenatal, perinatal, and postnatal. Now, I just wanted to mention here, well, if you look at the first one, uh, genetic causes so constitutes a significant proportion of the total. Now, interestingly, from our own practice, we have seen that. Uh, you can find a combination of intrinsic and uh, extrinsic in the same child. So, for example, recently we uh, saw a girl who had who was actually meeting criteria for uh, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, which is actually an acquired uh, uh, cause. Uh, but when we subsequently did her chromosome or microarray, she had a deletion also. So, you can have a combination of uh, the extrinsic and intrinsic in the same child. We always open to explore for genetic causes. Similarly, another child who we were evaluating for uh, global development today had homocysteine diuria, but subsequently also was tested positive for uh, uh, another genetic condition. So you can have a combination of the both and keep exploring those. Okay. Now, this slide I want to spend a little uh, time here. Although I'm not going to agree as the genetic condition, but just to have an idea. So if you look at chromosomal problems, you can have problems with numbers like uh, trisomy, trisomy uh, Down syndrome, which is 21, and 13 and 18 others also. But if you look at structure, you can have deletions, micro deletions, and duplications. Uh, I just wanted to uh, elaborate a little on Engelman and Prada Billy, which are basically uh, uh, parental trisomy uh, deletions. There can be other mechanisms such as imprinting, uh, quiet mutations, 
and unipetrid isomitin uh, conditions can be seen there. So, if you go to single gene disorders, now if you look at the autosomal dominance or predominance, there will be severe uh, intellectual disability in these this group of children. So, that means when you're looking at severe, uh, severe uh, intellectual disability, so one of the things you can consider from the genetic point of view would be autosomal uh, dominant inheritance. Some of these children also have craniofacial dysmorphism in this group of children. Now, autosomal recessive basically is a major group where you'll find metabolic causes in these conditions. And clinically, when you're uh, taking history, there will be pointers like uh, neuroregression, failure to try, intrauterine immune retardation, uh, episodic decompensation. So, those pointers in the history will give you a clue to explore for the same. Now, uh, if you look at this, is uh, from up to date, actually, just about the genes of the Various, various genetic testing. Now, from UK, they, they carried out long projects like DDD, which was deciphering the development of sort of project, followed by 100,000 genome projects. So, initially, they looked at uh, the value of uh, chromosomal microarray and subsequently whole genome sequencing. So, uh, from various studies, uh, they have looked at, for example, around 22,000 patients. And from 30 studies, where they found that about 10 to 15 percent yield can be found in. Uh, when we are doing chromosomal microarray. Now, last year, uh, in July, August, the UK has rolled out whole genome sequencing with different gene panels. And from our uh, global developmental point of view, all of that is relevant to the local uh, uh, NHS genomics uh, studies. So, whole genome sequencing, if you have done already microarray, so you can do whole genome sequencing with R49 uh, gene panel, which is basically intellectual disability. And interestingly, many of the patients who were uh, we're not diagnosed for many, many, many years. We have got diagnosis now. So, now, uh, they have been questioning about uh, uh, fragile X testing. So, who are the patients who are tested for fragile X? Now, fragile X is, uh, is a condition which can evolve as per the phenotype is concerned. So, you may not have typical fragile X features like in the beginning. Uh, but if you do, in that case, you can, of course, go for it. It will be specific testing, which I'll show you in the algorithm I'm uh, producing a presentation. But uh, if that is not there, uh, in unexplained intellectual disability, where there is family history of intellectual disability, you can. Uh, so, if there is family history of intellectual disability, so you can still consider it in unexplained, without any typical dysmorphic features. And similarly, if uh, there is an unexplained uh, ID in either uh, uh, males or females, and, and microarray is negative, you can do it there also. Right. Now, why we should uh, make a diagnosis in children with uh, global development delay and uh, intellectual disability? One, that it brings a closure for the parents and families that, okay, now we have an explanation for that. Number two, it can help you prognosticate the condition for that particular child uh, and for the family. Then you can use this information for genetic counseling, prenatal diagnosis, pre implantation diagnosis, for uh, uh, informed decision making. Yes. Similarly, uh, as uh, Dr. Zara mentioned in her uh, presentations, why should we do neurometabolic investigation in global developmental delay? There is a rationale now that uh, the, the neurometabolic conditions which are treatable, the number has actually, uh, as of uh, uh, yesterday, has gone to around 200 now. So when we say treatable, that does not mean that curing those conditions. It can be just slowing down the deterioration. It can just be an improvement in cognition. It can just be, but some of the conditions where now enzyme replacement therapy is available or uh, gene therapy is available. So there, it, it can make, make a huge difference. And that, that provides the rationale for doing neurometabolic investigations. Now, diagnostic approach, as we know, gold standard is a comprehensive Clinical assessment forms the cornerstone of any diagnostic process. We all know and we all take history and do examinations and investigations. But before I go into that detail, okay. So and this is and there are different algorithms. American Academy of Neurology they have given one algorithm. There is another algorithm suggested by British Columbia in Canada. This is from our trust where I was working, and this is basically. A produced uh, and published in Archive of uh, Disease in Childhood, Dr. Mithyantha, she is from Neurodevelopmental Pediatrics, and uh, 
Dr. Rachel Neen, who is from Neurology, where I was working with them. So they have very, very simple uh, uh, algorithm. Before I go into details, it's very good to follow here. So if we look at uh, initial assessment, history examination, uh, with that you can consider uh, doing uh, vision and hearing assessment as still clinical. Based on this, you can have either a recognizable phenotype, uh, if you find that, which may be based on this morphology, or uh, anthropometric findings, small head, large head, or any abnormal neurology, or uh, any neurocutaneous markers, which I'll show you shortly. Based on that, you can make that uh, diagnosis or impression and then investigate specifically. If you can't do that, that group will be unexplained ID or global development. Related. It is in that group where you go for uh, uh, stepwise investigations of uh, a particular group, neurometabolic workup and you do first year and then second is if you either concerned with metabolic medicine, genetics or neurology and or if you know the presentation of conditions such as for example if you know congenital disorders of glycosylation they can present the global developmental delay, hypotonia, seizures, there is a skeletal phenotype, you can have immunodeficiencies so if you know those features or discuss with them then you can arrange for those investigations. Similarly Conditions such as creatine synthesis disorders, it can be uh, gamut, ADAT or uh, creatine transporter problems, they present the global developmental delay, autistic features or autism-like behavior and involuntary movements. So if you get that phenotype, then you can investigate on those lines. Similarly, urea acid cycle disorders or ASI carbon carbon problems or MCAT. So if you have that knowledge or discuss with the metabolic team or neurogenetics team or neurology, then you can do the second tier. And then, uh, so this is how it will proceed. So doing it stepwise is basically uh, for two reasons. One, that if you just bombard the battery of cells, you might end up having some non-specific results which you might not be able to explain. And then both clinician and parents start chasing those and you end up nowhere. So it should be based on uh, that knowledge, discuss and share with those people. Okay, so standard history, you know, but just important, you can, presenting a player can be concerned about development, raised by parents, school, screening test. Now, very important is that prenatal history, if you take this, it may be relevant to vaccine culture more, uh, some of the things, but smoking, alcohol, drugs, now drugs is really relevant to everywhere. Uh, sodium valproate used in, uh, in mothers of unborn fetuses can give 30% global development really, in addition to malformation. So very important, and then infections including torch. But this is important, prematurity is one of the causes associated with the global development of delay. Mode of delivery, condition at birth, need for resuscitation, these are relevant uh, informations. Now, uh, I'll skip um, uh, development history, we know we how to take development history, or do it on a standardized tool such as Griffiths and other things. Uh, but uh, family history is important in these cases. So three generation pedigree, now, history of recurrent uh, miscarriages, uh, neonatal deaths, sudden infant deaths, uh, IUGRs, and then uh, uh, neuroregression, all this information can be very helpful. Uh, standard examination, general physical examination, but neurocutaneous markers, anthropometric measurements, small head, large head, abnormal neurology, focal deficits, spasticity, uh, movement disorder, all these can give you clues towards uh, different conditions and systemic of course for visceromagy, ophthalmology uh, for uh, 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 cherry red spots and those kind of things. I am not going into details but at the end of this assessment you should, do, should be able to make two decisions whether it is a recognizable phenotype or it is an unexplained uh, GDD and IDD. So, uh, so as I mentioned earlier, recognizable phenotype go for specific testing, fragile X, red syndrome, whatever you find. Uh, then unexplained is where you will do, okay this is just, I will not go into details of uh, uh, what these are but this is just to highlight this morphology, it could be synophorus, it could be central hypoplasia, <laughs> it could be low set ears, it could be low hairline, it could be cleft palate and whatever and neurocutaneous markers are also very important. Uh, you can have neurofibroma, uh, you can have uh, leech nodules, you can have uh, Caffeolar spot, you can have Ashley's region, you can have a chagrin, sorry, you can have a chagrin patch, okay, chagrin patch, and uh, similarly, uh, 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 incontinentia pigmentae and hypomelanosis of uh, ito, all these things. 
And so, first investigations we have already spoken about. Now, the reason when to decide that there is a delay, but it is not a recognizable phenotype, and it is here you will go for a first year and second year investigation. Mm -hmm. At the moment, from genetic point of view, microarray and the fragile X is the first year, but whole genome sequencing as we were doing in UK, because there now we are doing more liberally. It is still second line, but if you have already got microarray, you can have uh, request for this. Neurometabolic investigations, as I mentioned to you, I quickly wanted to show this slide. If you see the disparity here, this is the uh, okay proposed. This was the UK. Uh, uh, this one, 2006, and this is devised by your center. This is UK proposed, and this is US, and this is Irish. So look at the disparity. I'm not going to details, uh, but this is first line, and just look at the disparity. Second line, as I mentioned to you. Okay, so red flags are very important when you're looking at neurometabolic investigation. As I mentioned earlier, neuroregression, family history of uh, uh, family history of uh, uh, neuroregression, or uh, episodic decompensation, IUTR, failure to thrive, all those are uh, uh, one, uh, red flags. Now, this is a pinned study from the uh, UK, where they found these are the most, 10 most neurometabolic conditions seen in the UK. NCL late infant type, type NCL, NCL is a neuronal steroid lipofuscinosis, and juvenile type adrenolipodystrophy, metachromatic lipodystrophy, and PS3A San Filippos, which is mucobalistic diagnosis, and uh, Neiman C disease, and uh, Kravis. So, then uh, I've already mentioned uh, so specific testing, so whatever you find, go for that. And uh, metabolic investigation, as I told you, don't throw every test. It's easier to write, but then difficult to explain. If you find some abnormal result, you cannot justify. So first year should be, second year should only be done in consultation with genetics, metabolic medicine, or neurology, particularly if you know the phenotypes. What does uh, uh, congenital disorders of glycosylation present like? What, what does the uh, creatine synthesis disorder uh, uh, present like? If you know that pheno phenotype, that can help you decide those tests. Okay, so recommendations for this is my final slide. This is based on the same uh, algorithm. So first, take a detailed history, do a thorough examination, have that knowledge of dysmorphology and uh, neurocutaneous markers, and if that helps you decide about a recognizable phenotype, go for that investigation, which will be specific. If you can't label it as unexplained ID or global developmental delay, and it is here you will first go for first year investigation. Now, genetics is now very clear. We go for microarray and uh, fragile X testing first. If these are negative, you can go for whole genome sequencing. I'm not sure uh, what is the situation here, but I'm talking about UK, which is uh, the last year they have already rolled out. And then, uh, neurometabolic investigation, B selective. So, first do uh, uh, which are the slides I showed you. And if that comes back negative, then discuss with metabolic team, neurogenetics team, and neurology. And if you know the phenotype, you can then help narrow down choose a certain tests. So one of the lessons, one of the things is basically neuroimaging. Neuroimaging becomes first line MRI particularly if you have a large head, small head, sudden change in the head circumference, uh, abnormal neurology, focal, uh, long track signs or uh, extrapyramidal signs, all those will help with uh, decide about uh, neuroimaging. Now, neuroimaging under five years requires general anesthesia. Uh, and the risk involved in general anesthesia is very wide. In Brazil, one in 10,000 deaths. In UK, which uh, pops up on when we were requesting MRIs, one in 100,000. US, I was reading an article, one in 300,000. So it's quite safe in advanced countries. So if appropriately chosen, uh, you can request MRI, but never get stuck in doing it for something and then ending, ending up having a, an arachnoid cyst and then following it up for the rest of life. Thank you very much. Thank you.